I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life in Nicaragua. Today I'm in the studio and I'm doing something a little bit different and I'm on the mic right here because I tore up my throat something horrible last night. I, uh, I have terrible sleep apnea and I, I really can't breathe very well. Uh, I'm fine, but it's physical damage to my throat, so I have to do something much more low key. And so we're doing a video in, in the studio today, which is cool because I have a video uh, that we're going to be reviewing from The Wandering Investor, Why Buy a House in San Juan del Sur, Nicaragua, Great Value in Central America, and we're going to dig into that video right after the bump. Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for putting up with me being in the studio today, but I think we have a good video to dig into because I think it's got some interesting points and I think you guys like doing these kinds of videos. You just prefer when I have a little bit more energy and can talk a little bit better. But uh, yesterday, so happy with the video with Elton. That was so fantastic. We're definitely going to do more of those. He and I have been chatting in the background. We're like, there's feedback. It's so good. We're so happy and, and like, oh, we're really excited to do some more stuff like that uh, for you guys. Like we want to do it for you, but we want to do it for us too. Like it's a lot of fun. We really enjoy, both of us really enjoy doing that stuff. So uh, today I want to look at this video from The Wandering Investor. Now The Wandering Investor, he, uh, this is Ladislad. Um, he's been doing this for, I think about four years, uh, goes around uh, much of the world. I don't think he's focused on Latin America, but definitely has a lot of experience there. I think he's based there here. Um, but he, he was definitely in Africa for a while. He's from Oceania. So he's got some, some pretty broad, uh, uh, physical location background at the very least. Uh, and, and honestly, um, watching this video. So before we go into, uh, not always when I dig into a video, does this meet, need to be like a big negative thing? Like, oh, oh, we're, we're tearing apart this video. I don't want it to feel like that. We certainly did one with, with Elton just two weeks ago. It's just feedback, right? Just answers or, or my opinion on some of the things they're asking, whatever. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't have to be that way. Once in a while, we do catch someone who's clearly running a scam and I'm not going to let that go. So you'll get those sometimes. But um, I do want to, you know, I don't know Ladislad. I have not spoken to him um, from watching the video. I'm, I'm new to his channel. Um, he gives a good impression. He feels like he's honestly trying to provide good information. Uh, and I think for the most part in this video, he does. So let's lead off with this is not um, this is not a negative video. Uh, if you have not seen The Wandering Investor and you are interested in in kind of the, the general scope of, of relocation and looking for kind of a survey of things online, I don't know enough about his channel to sell it really well. But uh, he's got a busy channel. Um, certainly go check him out. Uh, watch the video we're talking about. Consider subscribing. Show him some love. Um, uh, I do like being the number one channel in your list, so don't show him too much love. We are the slightly larger channel at the moment. I just I always look that up, right? <laughs> It's a little bit of, a little bit of my vanity as it as it suddenly became uh, such a busy channel. No, but really, you know, go support all these great people who make uh, who put it. It takes a lot of effort to make these channels. So, I, so shout out to him for doing that. Um, but I want to go into some of the stuff that was on his channel on this on this video, uh, and I'll try to point out where I think he was doing a really good job and point out. Uh, so I think this video and the reason that I really want to uh, uh, talk about it is is twofold from a high level and then a couple like real specific things. Um, from a high level, one of the things uh, is that I feel that this is a good video that highlights some of the scams we're talking about. But very importantly, because we did recently talk about travel investors or travel or relocation services and how likely those are to be scams and why we decided we will not. And a lot of people have talked to me about this. We can do a, a, like a kind of extended discussion at the end. After the end of the video, I'm happy to stay on and kind of talk private, privately to those of you who want to stick around. But uh, so we've warned, there's so many services that go out and don't do their research. They're just people who are desperate to make money and look out for those in real estate and any kind of relocation assistance, because it, it generally indicates that they were lacking some other kind of thing. So, um, but there are people who also do a good job with that. And from what little bit I've looked at, he seems like someone who's, who's really putting in a lot of work, has put in a lot of time, um, and has given some real information. So I don't want you to jump to that I'm saying this about him. I don't think he's trying to scam anyone. I think he got scammed and his video seems to reflect a little bit of him being scammed in ways that we've predicted and we'll talk about. But also, it, I think it's very clear that you could see his reaction in the video where he was catching some questionable stuff being said and kind of like, oh, 
we need to warn people about stuff that maybe they weren't going to be warned about if he hadn't mentioned it. So fantastic, right? We just want to cover that. Okay, first thing that came up in the video. So he mostly did this as an interview with a real estate agent, which of course is a dangerous thing to do, right? Instead of going to an expert, we're going to go to a salesperson, someone who is paid to promote something, someone who makes their money um, with giving us information that's going to lead us to do a certain behavior. So I'm not saying that she did this specifically in the video. It's just a risky combination. So always be aware if someone is a real estate agent, or in this case, interviewing a real estate agent, as long as you understand that context and you're able to say, okay, this is a salesperson who is trying to get me to at least move towards buying something. Even the best salesperson is, is going to give you something in that direction. Just frame it that way, so be aware. Okay, this is a sales pitch to me. Um, so, okay. Number one, she said that they're seeing a, a change in who is coming. Uh, so she's San Juan del Sur. All this is San Juan del Sur, which for those who don't know, this is the main touristy enclave town in southwestern Nicaragua, just off the Costa Rican border. She pointed out that, and I, I, she didn't say it wasn't true in the past, but of the people who are coming now, they are mostly seeing Canadians. This is really fitting perfectly in time, uh, even though he made this video prior to the events this week, last week. This video is like four weeks old, um, uh, about Canadians coming to Nicaragua. So this really drives home that before Pierre mentioned Canadians coming down here, it was already in, in like the wandering investor talking about how Canadians were the main people coming to at least that portion of Nicaragua. And I can tell you it's basically all of Nicaragua, but you know, you have to take my word for it, but that was confirmed. So it was just great that they said that because, um, I think a lot of people really are like, well, okay, yeah, now that it's been mentioned, of course, Canadians are contacting you. No, this has been going on for a long time. When I was here in 2019, like it was super obvious that Canadians were the primary one. Uh, the second thing, and this is, some of these are just pointing out like interesting tidbits that he gave, right? Not, not common and good or bad or anything like that. Uh, he said that um, in a lot of the region, prices have increased. In a lot of places they have, Mexico especially, has seen some really significant price increases uh, since COVID. He said that since COVID, uh, prices uh, have, have kind of flattened off. Um, and I think it's important to note that since COVID, the prices have actually fallen slightly. Uh, they're not just holding steady. But that's but but not by very much, right? So if you're looking at it from a really high level, they, they're pretty close to holding steady. But it's important to note that some places COVID didn't cause a big drop in prices, but here during the COVID era and a little bit before, we had a massive price drop. So it's um, uh, he didn't get anything wrong. He didn't miss anything. He first came to Nicaragua during COVID or right at that time. So he, I don't believe he has any experience in Nicaragua prior to that, uh, but prior to uh, uh, that, that kind of general time frame, we had really high prices in 2016 and 2017. And right at the beginning of 2018, we were at this fever pitch where people were buying houses sight unseen, tripling you know, their value, ten, tenfolding their, their value, right? People were spending million dollars on places that had months before had been $100,000. It was silly money going on. It was, it was definitely a mad rush to see how quickly we could turn into Costa Rica. And then the uh, events of 2018 took place. The market collapsed. It started to recover by the time I was here in 2019. It was really well underway to recovery and then COVID hit. So the prices actually fell just that little bit before COVID. So that they've not come up after COVID is uh, an important point and that they maybe have even fallen since COVID because we're already talking about a market that went through a collapse just before COVID and COVID killed its recovery as opposed to a Mexico, a Panama, a Costa Rica who they may have seen a drop off in tourists during COVID itself, but they were at pretty good market rates prior to COVID. They didn't have a big drop just before it. Uh, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, one of the other things that I thought was really interesting, and he completely caught this, so it's just important when you're watching the video how important it is to drive this point home. The house that they showed in the video, and they just showed one example house. They didn't go around and look at a bunch of things. The house was very pretty. It looked nice. It has a nice view. And it's one of the things that's great about San Juan del Sur. As someone who lives elsewhere in the country, uh, so the San Juan del Sur general area, this goes a little bit outside the village, really does have this, uh, and you'll see it in the video if you watch this video, this kind of 
forested slopes going down to, to secretive bays sort of thing that's very unique in Nicaragua. You're not going to find that other places. You're going to find some amazing beachfront all over the country, but you're rarely going to come across uh, a spot where you have those high, far away from the, the ocean views. So that style of, of house, that style of view, very unique uh, in the San Juan del Sur area, and, uh, and it's beautiful, right? It's hard to argue with that being something that you would really want, but it is worth noting that in the rest of the country, it's very common to have beachfront houses. So when people talk about living on the beach in San Juan del Sur, often they mean within sight of the beach, quite some distance away. Absolutely fantastic. And for me personally, I would actually prefer that, right? So I don't mean this as a negative in any way, like they're not really on the beach. I don't want to really be on the beach. Being right on the beach has a lot of complications, risk, expenses, like it's difficult. Having amazing beach views, but being back a little bit often means kind of better sunset views and maybe some better access roads. And there's just a lot of positives that potentially come with that, not necessarily, but generally. And, uh, and you'll find that in San Juan del Sur. And plus it gives you a lot more houses. And that's one of the things about San Juan del Sur is the amount of real estate that can potentially see the water, at least in the distance, is extremely high. Whereas, I'll just use my own region, Ponaloya, the number of places that can see the water are only the number of places that touch the water. So we have way more houses that are actually on the water, but we don't have street after street after street after street of slopes where there's houses built to look over the house in front of them that all have beautiful views of the water, even if it's from some distance. San Juan del Sur has kind of the perfect level of slope and distance to which you get amazing views uh, and maximize the number of people who can actually take advantage of them. That's fantastic down there. That really does lead to a lot of what makes San Juan del Sur what it is. Uh, you can have a very high population, all of which, or nearly all of which, has some amount of view of the ocean. It really is amazing. There are these curved bays all over. And so people build all along the curves and they all see the ocean with different views, different airflow. It's one of the reasons why moving around within San Juan del Sur is so important because you don't know which area is going to have the airflow you like, the sunset view you like, the sunrise view that you like, access to the roads. There's just a lot of factors. So um, it's very different. Whereas if you're in Ponaloya, there's one straight road. Do you want to be near the north end or near the south end? It's a straight road. Everyone's in a line. Everyone's straight on the beach. Everyone has the same view. Everyone has the same sand. It's all excellent, but it's all the same. So that's very different in San Juan del Sur, and just something you need to know. Uh, but so this house, 350000 is what they quoted for it. Now, remember, a price that someone gives is, is kind of meaningless. Um, <clears throat> we know that, uh, in general, houses are not moving very quickly. Now, 350000 in San Juan del Sur feels incredibly high, and I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons why. One, houses like this don't tend to sell very quickly. Often they can sit on the market for months or, more likely, years. And she mentions that some houses don't move for one to two years. But as someone who was shopping in San Juan del Sur several years ago, I know that six and seven years are very realistic for houses to sit on the market. And when they finally do sell, they're selling often for a fraction of their listed price. So that can be very misleading. Saying that something's only been on the market a few months, this one may be true. Like there's no reason to not believe that this particular house was chosen because it had a high listing price and a low time it had just been built and was newly on the market. So it didn't give any real indicators of there being a problem, but it also showed that it didn't get snapped up. Uh, but we know they're not being snapped up. No one can make that claim, right? Like you can't even begin to pretend that. Like that's so ridiculous. But that the market is so stagnant is, is misleading and people just don't believe it. Like they're so one, just emotionally driven to be like, no, nah, there's no way it's like that. I, I'm so hopeful that things are good that they don't want to believe it. So your brain doesn't want to push you in the logical direction. And two, there's so much propaganda and marketing from the industry selling houses that they desperately need you to believe. And so they put out so much to convince you and to give you things to believe in uh, that things are not selling quickly, that it, it makes it easy to just accept that. So that, that tends to get us. Um, but 350 to me, living in this market, even for San Juan del Sur, feels outrageously expensive. We don't know exactly how big the lot is, but it's a single lot that was split in half. She mentioned that. So it's a tiny lot. It's very far away from the water. Beautiful views. Um, probably on a very remote dirt road. And the hope is that someday the future road that is coming through the Pacific Coast Highway is going to pass somewhere by it and, and upgrade uh, its accessibility. That will probably happen. That is expected, but there's a lot of questions there. Will it go where they think? Do they even think it will go past that house? 
maybe. It wasn't really mentioned, but there's a lot of ifs with that, right? And there's a reason why every piece of property along the Pacific Coast Highway projected route isn't automatically super expensive because one, it's potentially a very long way away. Uh, you know, construction just takes time. And two, we don't know enough about it to really know how it's going to impact values. Um, how, how much traffic is going to be on it? How well maintained is it going to be over time? How promoted is it going to be? Are people going to care because of the way it connects? There's just a lot of ifs. We think it's going to do a lot of great things. I think it's been well thought through. I think it's generally a good idea. I've got a lot of positive about it. It's just that those positives come with a bunch of as long as or ifs or we thinks. Um, and, and we just some of it needs to be seen. So investing high in the hopes that some future construction will have a very specific effect is, is a long shot. But 350000 um, when I've been in San Juan del Sur, places like this, I tend to see much more realistically between, I think, one fifty and two. It's a very small place, but very good view. But importantly, um, the last time I was in San Juan del Sur actively shopping, uh, places that were much larger than this, uh, directly across from the water, were in the 100s, and relatively new places, like very modern, nine bedrooms. This was, I believe, a two or a three. Um, nine bedrooms on the water with commercial kitchen, currently operating as a hotel, literally on the sand, and actually in San Juan del Sur. This house is not in San Juan del Sur. It's just off in the outskirts with, with remote views of a bay. It's not in a village at all, uh, which means there's a lot of just, there's a lot of challenges when you're that far out, right? Nothing wrong with that. A lot of people like being far out, so that's fine, but it costs less. You save money being far out. In the village, like right on the main San Juan del Sur beach, they could not sell at 250000 Right, more than three times the size of this place, much nicer, established, on the sand with its own private beach. Well, its own sand, you don't control the beach. In the village, every single factor to make it as expensive as anything could be, nowhere near this price and unable to sell at that lower price. I'm sure it eventually sold. It's been, it's been a little while, but it was sitting on the market for some time at a fraction of this price. So that's really important to internalize that the real world sales of houses and, and businesses, um, even in San Juan del Sur, is often much less than things are being listed for, than people are being hopeful for. Um, and uh, we mentioned this a lot in the video, everybody is going to make videos and, and tell people, and I'm not saying that the, the wandering investor did this, he's just repeating what a real estate agent is telling him, but he's being used as a mouthpiece to repeat really, really high prices. And when you do this, like he's not doing anything dishonest, he's not trying to do anything dishonest, he's trying to give you real information. And he's not in any way saying this is the real price, right? If anything, he said the opposite. So fantastic, kudos to him, he's doing a good job, happy, right? But if you're a real estate agent, you can go to a hundred channels like his and say, okay, here's the list price of these houses and just keep repeating it. And then you go from channel to channel to channel to channel. And they're all like, okay, I talked to a real estate agent. They're asking 350 for this house. And then you over time go, wow, 350 must be the value of that house. Everyone says so. They're not. There's one person saying it's 350,000 and a whole bunch of people saying, I was told they're asking 350,000 which all of them are being honest. All of that is what they're asking, in theory. Uh, they're all, right? But when you hear it from a bunch of places, it sounds like this is a giant market. There's a thousand houses and they're all around 350. No, no, no. There's one house being listed in a million places uh, and it's always the same. So people don't realize how small this market is, that they really are looking at just one or two houses and the same ones being listed over and over and over again and mentioned over and over and over again. Um, and creating these, it's it's a hot market when it's one house that hasn't sold. Uh, when I was looking in San Juan del Sur, foolishly, right, it was not the right market for us, but we did look extensively. One of the things we constantly found is there weren't houses on the market of interest. And I don't mean because they were too expensive, I mean because there weren't that many on the market. The market isn't very big. And so when you would go and look, you'd be like, well, I have something, like I need a certain number of rooms, I, need it. I want it to be somewhere near the actual village. Once you actually put in a couple of requirements, you'd be like, okay, we got like three places to look at right now, maybe a new one will come on the market at some point. And then you would look at those and like, well, this one's falling down, they acted like it was new. This one's not really for sale, someone's just hopeful that you'll make a high enough offer they can talk someone into selling it, things like that. And so that was really an eye-opener that the, the prices were... Uh, very low and and there just wasn't a bulk of prices and a bulk of transactions to establish some kind of baseline so <clears throat> that 
one piece on its own. Uh, my belief that this is a, a, a highly overpriced asking price, but I know why they do it, right? So it's logical because they're, they're there to manipulate your mental state and make you think houses cost more than they do. That's their job, so they're, they're doing it. But when you have someone like the wandering investor, he's not really in a position, both because he doesn't live in Nicaragua, so he doesn't have the insight, and it's clearly an interview with a real estate agent. So this is an interview with a salesperson. It makes a lot of sense why uh, people who are doing relocation services and things like that, investment services across a, a region, do this because they don't have any possibility of having the resources to go and do this themselves. And I know from his YouTube channel, right, I know his statistics, I know how little money there is to be made in, in YouTube in general, right? A, a channel doing millions of views a year won't hit $1,000 a month. Right, it probably won't come close to it. You're much more likely to be like 500. We're, we're talking about a channel that cannot afford staff, cannot afford uh, to have um, you know people in different countries doing continuous research and to do research as we know in Nicaragua, just to do all. You know, first of all, no one person has experience with all the different residency processes. I sure don't, right? But I know people who've done most of them, and I've you know got resources that have talked. To, like I have more resources than many people. And I can tell you how few resources I have, right? So when you're talking to most places, especially people who are passing through Nicaragua, the amount of resources that they have approach zero. They have at best a cursory glance and it's like, okay, how does this work in this one moment in time? Are they keeping up to date with how it works, how it's changed in the past to the, to the future? Have they looked at different residency options? Are they aware that you don't need residency, but you could do other things? Like there's all these complexities and it takes time and personal investigation uh, to figure many of them out. And, and sometimes like uh, we have a friend and, and someone from the channel who just went through and did residency mostly on their own as fast as they could. And it was like three weeks. And it's like, okay, we now have a stake in the ground. You can do residency three weeks, super cheap, no problems. Right, and, and he's, he's got some new information he's gonna get us on some things like with driver's licenses. That sounds interesting, right? Because there's some, he'll like, different people do different research or new things change. Like I just happened to find out one thing from the Department of Health that no one else had run into yet. Well, if you don't have a group of people, how do you find those things out? You may never be the one that runs into it. Had it been my wife and not me, she would never have known because it didn't affect her. It affected me. And so little things like that. And so he has this problem that he doesn't have the insight. He can't. There's just no way for him to have enough insight into the market to give advice. So what ends up happening, this is the danger, is that the only reasonable option for someone who's doing this type of travel advisory is to go out and basically find salespeople who have money to be made, and that's why they're willing to do the channel. It's because they're going to make money by, um, by you know, advertising on the channel, get their name out there, and then sell you something. Right? That is, that's the game here. And he is able to get, uh, I'm sure, free advice, a free consultation for the channel, the interview, because this person's a salesperson and they're hoping that you will use them for real estate. And I'm sure of the people doing real estate, San Wendel Search is probably really good, right? So fine. But we have to look at it with this knowledge of there's no possible way that he's an expert on Nicaragua um, and no possible way that he can evaluate whether the prices that she's giving him are reasonable. And so that means that when she gives him 350000 all he can do is ask him, and he does, right? So great. Uh, he asks some really poignant questions that matter a lot, but he has no way to, to look at the camera and say, I think this should be 200000 or whatever. And, and the same thing. When I go look at houses and just show you houses, because we don't do any real estate, we just go look at the houses themselves and not that often, all we can do is tell you what they're asking. And in theory, I can be like, I've seen other places in the market and this is what they're asking. And this is what people are really paying. Um, you know, you have to do some of your own analysis. Um, I can at least give you comparatives. He's got nothing, right? Absolutely nothing to work from. Doesn't know, I'm sure, anyone who's actually bought a house, anyone who's actually renting to find out what real numbers are like. And then there's always the problem of if you only find one or two people, you don't know if that's like really, really skewed. Like for example, here, I can easily find someone who's paying thousands of dollars a month of rent here in Leon, and if you go and talk to them and say, how much are you paying? They're like, $1,500 a month, and you're like, whoa, I found a place for $1,200. It must be a deal. It's going to sound like a deal, but those of us who live here and have gone out and done the footwork and priced out places on our own are like, well, I would never pay over $500 for that, and I can get 20 different places for $500 that meet or beat what you're looking at for $1,500 
he just he just didn't know what he was doing and paid way too much. That's way over market. Um, so until you have people who are doing the work on the ground, have multiple people to talk to, um, you don't even begin to get real prices. And uh, and even then, there's some risk that we're still being, you know, are we still overpaying? That's possible. Much less likely, like we have a lot of people looking out for us. We have a lot of resources at this point, but it took a long time. Um, and, and we'll always probably pay $25 over, right? But are we paying hundreds over? I don't think so. But we have to recognize that that's possible. Um, but so that that's a really important piece to understand here that there's no way he's providing guidance as to the price, except for that he then asks, so, and this should be a huge red flag, so this is a, a tourism market. She mentions that these are not primary houses for people. These are being built as like secondary houses, like as I'm from the Northeast, that's like a beach house, right? These are vacation homes. Um, but they also mentioned then like all these tax advantages, which doesn't make sense. If it's a vacation home, it doesn't give you a tax advantage in any jurisdiction I know. Um, so it's like they're trying to sell it based on moving, but then their numbers are based on affluent people who are making it a vacation home and it won't count for those things. So you gotta be really careful what they're mixing together. But he asked this really poignant question is, so it's a tourist area, all this stuff, I can cover my cost by renting it. I can make money, what's the investment opportunity? Because he's an investor, right? So that's his, that's his thing. And immediately she was, she was very honest, right? She, no even during the busy season, right? So first of all, Nicaragua doesn't really have a busy slow season. It's a very minor thing. The number of people that are here busy versus slow is tiny. And most people can't figure out when the busy and slow is because, I mean, there really is a busy and slow season. Don't get me wrong. But places on the beaches up here are still full in the slow season. Um, the busy season just means that the restaurants are full. But to have like an Airbnb and have it only be rentable during the busy season, if then, and she was kind of like, she was trying to sell it as much as possible without actually being misleading, which is her job. And if she's doing her job well, that is exactly what she's supposed to do, right? Don't be inaccurate, but but promote it as much as she can. It really came across of you're never going to make more than one or two months out of the year where it's paying its way. That implies that they know that the cost of the house is wildly out of whack for demand in the market. If there was a reasonable demand, and these were actually nice location vacation homes, the rental market would expect be expected to be quite lucrative year round. And in this case, it sounded like it was not lucrative ever, but might allow you to break even temporarily for part of the year. So he then, you could see him change, um, and he's like, okay, so these are, these are definitely a lifestyle house. You're buying this for your lifestyle, not because it's a good deal. So at one moment, they're saying these are, and the title, of this video, why buy a house in San Juan del Sur, great value in Central America, you could see on his face that this was not great value, this was not a place to buy, right? That was from a financial perspective. So his title is very misleading and I don't feel he pointed out, this is my one complaint really, is that he didn't point out in the video that he visibly had a moment where he knew that title was fake and this is not a good value, even if you're spending much more in a Costa Rica, for example, those are much more likely to hold their value because the prices you're gonna see, let's say you spend 700,000 in Costa Rica, but can you sell it again for 700,000? Then it's not that bad of a deal, even if it's expensive. But if you buy this for 350 in Nicaragua, are you ever gonna be able to sell it for 250? Probably not, that's a problem. That one in Costa Rica, you could probably rent it out and at least break even, if not make money, probably make money. This one in Nicaragua, could you rent it out and make money? No, oh, so not a good value, not a good deal. It's a low price, but it's not the same thing. Nicaragua is full of great deals. These aren't them. Then, very important thing comes up is they want to sell a San Juan del Sur, which is obviously the point of the video, and to some degree it's clickbait. But they're very clear. When he does a price comparison to make it sound good, he says, if you were looking for a two-bed, like he says, like a place like this, and you looked in and he cherry-picked Panama, Costa Rica, and Mexico, whose peso has gone through the roof recently, that this would cost much more. That's absolutely true. It would cost much more for a property like this with a view like this in any of those countries. Absolutely, completely true. However, that does not make it a great value in Central America. So first of all, Mexico is not in Central America, except maybe Chiapas, but that doesn't really have a lot of ocean, and Chiapas is outrageously cheap. So Chiapas would, be unex it would not expect anything in Chiapas to be this expensive. Maybe at best about the same. I'm not an expert in Chiapas, so I could be a little bit off there for sure, but be aware, okay. But Mexico is not Central America. 
So that was a fake comparison by the title, but it's important to keep in mind that is not a good Central American option. Uh, Panama also is not Central America. The region is known as Central America and Panama. Panama has a lot of affinity with Central America. M some parts of Panama can be considered Central America, but Panama proper is not. Panama proper is east of the canal and is considered South America. It is both South America geographically and it is South America politically and culturally. So when you're in Panama, when you're in Central America, that is not part of Central America. North Americans sometimes consider it that because it's just a handy way to teach it in school and they're not aware of the region, but it is not part of Central America, it never has been. If you wanted to argue that the border zone was, was Central America, yeah, you could make a good argument for that, but, but Panama as a whole, no, it is, and just same thing with Colombia. Is Colombia Central American? Clearly not, but there is an island of Colombia that borders uh, Nicaragua, and you could easily argue that that's Central America, but you could also argue that that portion of Nicaragua isn't Central America, but is just Caribbean island. So it, some of those definitions get fuzzy, some do not, but Panama, no, not Central America. So that two of the three Central American uh, comparisons he picked aren't in Central America really indicates how much, and I don't believe this is really him trying to mislead us, I don't, I don't mean to imply that, I think this is, we're seeing him having been tricked by salespeople who know exactly how to frame San Juan del Sur to try to make it look like a value. And so they frame it against other regions of the world where prices are generally higher. Then in Central America, we have two very small, the two smallest populations in Central America have really, really high prices due to very close affinity with either Europe or the United States, tons and tons and tons of tourists, uh, and, and so they are not really compar comparable because they are absolutely different places. Uh, but they are in Central America, and in the Northeast, that is Belize, with a population of only 400,000. It is outrageously expensive to a point where, yes, of course, Nicaragua looks super cheap. The other in the South is Costa Rica. Neither of those participate as if they're part of Central America in most cases. They act like they're from other regions of the world and just happen to physically be in what is considered Central America. And a lot of Central Americans don't consider Belize to be, but it is regardless of what they consider. The core of Central America, the, the one that is known as the, the former members of the Central American Federation, while Costa Rica was a member, it has distanced itself from them uh, since that time, the CA4 of Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, represent the vast majority of the land, culture, and population of Central America. I mean, huge, hugely, something like 40 or 50 million people, while Costa Rica and Belize combined are about six. So they represent between 10 and 12 percent of all of Central America. They are on the outside fringes of it, whereas the rest are in the middle. And they uh, represent a very small, probably similar percentage of the land mass, while the others are very, very large. Uh, Nicaragua is more than twice the size of Costa Rica, or almost exactly twice the size. Honduras and Guatemala are very close to Nicaragua in size. And then uh, Salvador is very small, but many times the size of Belize. So uh, when you look at those, like in all ways, the majority of Central America is these countries. When you look at $350,000 for this house, not only is that not in any way whatsoever, in the wildest, craziest, most insane world, in line with normal Nicaraguan prices, if you went so much as two miles outside of San Juan del Sur, nobody would ever entertain a price anything like that. And in San Juan del Sur, basically no one would either, but foreigners who are coming in and don't know how to evaluate houses will often think that it's somehow plausible. And that's that this video portrayed it as plausible is kind of where I feel it gets a little bit silly that um, at some point just repeating wildly inaccurate numbers and then pretending that they might be okay, it's a little bit much. But all of Nicaragua, except for San Juan del Sur, all of Honduras, except for Roatan, all of El Salvador, all of Guatemala, would look at this price and just laugh and be like, no, that house should be 50,000, maybe 150 at the highest. Like these are, these are just crazy numbers. Maybe somewhere on Atitlan would start to get up towards this. So these numbers are just bizarrely out of whack for what we would consider all of Central America. So saying that this comparative to the region, saying a great value in Central America, this is the exact opposite of great value in Central America. This is a ridiculously bad value. 
in Central America. That doesn't mean San Juan del Sur isn't a wonderful place with beautiful views that you may want to choose. That is fine. And it is not to say that you always want to get a good value. Sometimes you're just willing to get a bad value because it, it services your needs and it makes you happy. All those things are fine, but you want to go into this with your eyes wide open and be aware that this is a uh, uh, apparently a series of manipulative sales pitches have been fed to the, the wandering investor and his lack of either um, ability to analyze what the market is actually like or uh, an attempt to be journalistic and simply repeat whatever false information is given to him, which I realize is not true journalism, but it is what, especially in the United States, is often passed as journalism. Um, there's this excuse of, well, I'm just here to quote people when really you should be investigating and seeing, is that true? But uh, whether he's just here because his, his thing is just to repeat what other people tell him, uh, maybe he's being paid, but I find that unlikely. He didn't give that impression or feeling but it's certainly possible someone who's a very good salesman is not going to give that impression, but he may have sales agents paying him to go on and, and promote, but he did call them out. He did make it. If you were paying attention, you would know that he was definitely giving you a, um, this isn't a very good deal, people, uh, look and feel. But like his title and stuff, if you're looking at this very quickly, it's going to give you the impression that this might be a viable price and that it's good for the region. It is not a viable price, and it is atrocious for the region. Um, other places in, in Nicaragua, we would expect a house like this to sell much closer to 80000 New construction, views of the water, maybe a little bit more. It's going to depend where you are, um, but, but this is just insane what this price is. Um, but much more insane is comparing it to Central America and acting like somehow this is a value. So that's important. Uh, one of the things that they did claim on the video is that there's a boom post-COVID. That is not the case. There is a, a deficit post-COVID. Uh, during COVID, obviously, there was a uh, not lockdown here in Nicaragua. That's one of the reasons that people are very interested in Nicaragua, uh, is the lack of lockdown indicates a good behavior by the government in times of crisis. Uh, specifically, this is one of the things driving Canadians, specifically out of Canada and specifically to Nicaragua. Canada went to some of the most insane lockdowns. Um, in the region, possibly in the world, people are very off-put by the behavior of the government due to and subsequently from COVID, uh, using COVID as an impetus for things. Um, and when they then look at Nicaragua and realize the insanely opposite behavior, that they didn't lock down, they didn't require anything, they definitely made things available, they promoted things, they have... Canadians, of course, ended up uh, experiencing what realistically was a very strong backlash. Uh, the government was so over the top and so clearly not looking out for its citizens. They weren't doing things um, because they were going to be good for, for people. They were doing things because, who knows, they, they were exerting control. They were uh, using the opportunity for things. That created a very strong backlash. And, and it, was, it was a really noticeable response that people you know, created uh, big groups of anti-vaxxers, for example, because they've lost trust uh, in their government, they lost trust in the medical infrastructure, uh, whereas places like Nicaragua that did not do that, did not have those kinds of lockdowns um, and, and simply provided education and options and, and, you know, they gave vaccines but only when you wanted it, um, by not forcing it, by not pushing it, by not having those lockdowns, people maintain that trust uh, in, the, in the government, they maintain that trust in the medical infrastructure and our vaccine rates, even though we got the vaccine here, much later, like six to 12 months later than the US and Canada, the vaccination rates were much higher in no time, like nearly overnight. Uh, and so um, the, the, we didn't have lockdowns, we didn't have mandatory distancing, we didn't have mandatory masks, any of that stuff, but all of it was okay, right? So no one saw, again, US and Canada wearing a mask became a political statement, not wearing a mask was a political statement. All these things became politicized. In Nicaragua, that didn't happen. Because they didn't have lockdowns, they just said, here's things you can do. So people who wanted to wear a mask, no one worried that someone else wore a mask. If you wore a mask, you didn't wear, worry that someone else didn't wear a mask, right? It, like, just everybody was okay with everybody. Do your own thing, make your own decisions, and, um, and, it, and it created a much healthier, much more effective system. So I think Canadians looking at it at first uh, kind of uh, have a, well, that there, we love it because it was more free, right? But uh, at the end, it's also, oh, it was also much more effective and they have higher rates of 
mask usage, higher rates of vaccine. I think that throws people off because voluntarily, when there isn't any reason to believe that the government's doing something nefarious, when there's no reason, there's no health infrastructure to make money on this, right? None of those things existed here. And so that these things were freely available and it was purely education-based, the, the uh, faith in the institutions was there. And so people voluntarily went and did those things at a much higher, I mean, so much higher rate. Uh, and it was really noticeable. So those things were a big deal. Uh, but so obviously during COVID, while we didn't lock down here, we also didn't have flights because the airlines just shut down. So with no flights coming in, there was no tourism. So the entire tourism industry all but completely collapsed during that time. So buying houses, all those kinds of things, went to a standstill. And I know because I was trying to buy houses during that time, it was insanely difficult. Um, and that's when we noticed that things had been on the market for a long time before COVID. And we're still on a long time after COVID. And just uh, we, we got a lot of insight from that. Um, but the idea that there was a uh, post-COVID boom only applies if you don't include the time before COVID. If you're saying, well, yeah, during COVID, when it was physically impossible to reasonably buy a house, then after that, once you were physically able to buy a house, more people were buying houses than when they couldn't. Well, obviously, right? That's kind of a silly thing to say. But if you're comparing it to the time before COVID, no, that is not the case. Nicaragua was at its all-time high not that long before COVID, and that all went away before COVID uh, right as COVID started, and then during COVID, obviously. So it has not come back, right? We're back to just before COVID, right? We're, we're, but we're, we're not in a post-COVID boom by any stretch in any way whatsoever. That is not true. We are, since COVID, we have been in a continuous lull um, that, if anything, has gone down. In a similar vein, they talked about uh, that some of these places, oh, they found some builders are building some new places and some people are finding some luck with that. That's probably not very accurate. I'm sure somebody has had luck somewhere. Right? It's, it's not to say that there's zero luck, but one of the things we talk about pretty often on the show uh, is people want to know building versus buying. What makes sense? And this is a general rule. Just like with the rental rules, right? If your rent isn't enough to cover your mortgage, you need to really think about what's going on. What's wrong? Right? Well, same thing. In this market, we have a time where the market is very depressed. If something's on the market, it's been sitting there for a long time. So prices go down. People are desperate. It's very difficult uh, to sell a house. And they did allude to this in the video, so that's great, that uh, don't buy here with the thought that you're just going to sell immediately. Things can sit in inventory for a long time, much longer than was, was hinted at, but for a long time. And so if you build, for the purpose of selling, you're, you're probably not getting anywhere near the value that you should. If you're building for yourself, well, that's great. You can custom build and, and maybe that makes sense for you because you want something that, that no one else is going to build or in a spot where no one has built, that's fine. If you're looking at it from an investment perspective, however, it's important, very important to understand that right now, if you were to buy a house that, let's say that at market average over time, right, we look at the, the big grand scheme, we have a house that we say, this house is worth about 100000 um, should the market be in good shape? And you say, okay, I'm going to build a house just like that. So in theory, its value should be 100000 And part of the reason that we determine that value is that someone could go buy that line, land, hire workers, and build that house for $100,000. And so that's kind of a, a way to think of it. Oh, okay, there, there's a cost of building and that is the value of the house. Because if you sell it for more than that, people say, well, other than the convenience factor, why don't I just build a custom one myself and get exactly what I want, exactly where I want? So they don't tend to go very much above that. And if you sell very much below that, why would someone build if building loses you money? So there's a, there's a sweet spot there where, you, where people are willing to pay for convenience and pay to be able to look and feel and be inside the house and sometimes builders have some like lock on a specific piece of land or whatever so there's ways that you there's ways to be profitable of course as a builder but when you're in Nicaragua and a house that is normally at a hundred thousand is currently selling for fifty thousand and they're sitting in inventory for a long time and they're very slow at moving why would someone want to build because that's going to cost them a hundred thousand dollars to build a house that they could buy for fifty thousand that is where the majority of the market is right now, that there are available houses that are being sold at dramatically under their normal median value. And so because of that, if you were to build, you are going to build something that will instantly lose a large portion of its value. So if you build a $100,000 house, you say, oh, I just spent $100,000, I decided I don't want to be here anymore, let's sell it. 
you could be looking at a 50% loss and quite a bit of time very likely sitting on the market waiting to sell. It's not guaranteed. Of course, somebody gets lucky, but that's very important to be thinking about that at least in the short term, if you build, your value is going to evaporate. And then let's say you hold out and you hold out for a long time and with inflation and all these different things, that house becomes worth 200000 Great. You say, okay, I built a $100,000 house and eventually it, as an investment it turned into 200000 I made $100,000. I doubled my money. But if you were to buy a house today that was selling at 50000 but had a value, a, a median value of 100000 when it in the future gets to 200000 you will quadruple your money instead of doubling. So even if you're just investing, even if you're whatever, it's, it's significant to get in when it's cheap and leverage the fact that the market is currently depressed. If you build in Nicaragua, you're giving up the big price advantage that Nicaragua has right now. And that's a big deal, right? One of the things driving people, certainly not the only thing, there's lots of reasons to come and move to and live in Nicaragua. We talk about them all the time, but a major driving factor is right now, houses are so cheap, property is so cheap, the market is so depressed that it's moving so slowly. If you're a buyer, it's, you just have so much buying power, so much buying opportunity, why it, it would have to be an extreme circumstance where you would want to come to Nicaragua and give up that massive advantage as a buyer just to custom build. Now again, if you're building and it's for yourself, you're going to retire, you, want to, you plan on owning the house for 50 years, and uh, that custom build is going to give you exactly the house that you need to have, okay, it's, it's still not a bad value, and uh, uh, you don't care about the investment value of it. It is your house to live in. Okay, that is a good reason to build, as long as you're thinking it through and running the numbers and making sure you know. But if you're hoping to put in money and make it an investment. Oh, I'm going to save money. My house is part of my nest egg. Well, if you build, you're eroding your nest egg really quickly in most cases. Same thing going. They mentioned flipping and they were very quick in mentioning flipping and kind of like, yeah, not really a thing. And that's exactly why. Houses are undervalued. Flipping is generally something that works well when houses are overvalued. In that case, you're making a certain amount of money simply on because you have a house on inventory. You're able to move it incredibly fast. All those things really matter, right? You gotta you gotta have a market where you can get a high price really quickly, and it's in demand. And the fact that you have a move-in ready house with all the things just perfect for somebody, and they're gonna pay a premium because they want to get in and, and get some value out of that. But here in Nicaragua, if you go in and customize a house for someone, you up its value. Again, mo you know, for every $100 you put in, you're only going to get 50 back in most cases. But also when you're flipping, when you have uh, a lack of inventory, you control part of the inventory so that you're able to convince people that they want the changes you made as long as you make them pretty well. But here, you're going to have a problem that if you make a change and make the house more expensive, why would I spend $60,000 on a house you in improved that isn't designed just for me when I can for 50000 buy a house that you didn't do that for, uh, move in right away and for very little money hire a crew that's going to come in and do exactly what I want. Maybe I'll spend a tiny bit more than you would have on a flip but maybe I'm getting things that I want. And so it's very rare that you would want to do a flip because almost always you'd be not increasing the value of the house. And even if you did, the amount extra you could get is very small. You almost certainly would lose money on every minute, every dollar spent on the new place. And it will likely sit on inventory for a really long time, tying up your financial resources. Because even if you do things that people find relatively valuable and they're willing to pay for the time and effort that you put into it, which is unlikely, then you still likely will have it sit on the market for a really long time. And, and your investment dollars will erode because they're tied up in a house and you're paying even really, really tiny property taxes, it's still a loss versus a gain because you have to compare. If you have $100,000 tied up in a house and it sits on the market for two years and you only get $100,000 out of it, you, you've made nothing, but your money's been tied up. But if you took that same $100,000 and just threw it into an index fund, you'd most likely have made uh, between eighteen dollars and $25,000 during that same time without even having to work. And so... Think about how much interest uh, you, would, you would pay, or if you have the cash, how much not interest you would gain, and so forth. It's just, it's very, very, very difficult. If you're going to flip houses, you have to be able to sell them immediately. That 
is basically guaranteed to not happen here. Of course, anybody could get lucky, put a house on the market, someone who wants exactly that house sees it that day, decides the price is okay and buys it, but the chances of that are extremely, extremely low in Nicaragua right now. So those are, those are my thoughts on watching this video. Overall, really, it really was a decent video with a lot of good insight um, and shows some nice areas and, and these things you can learn from. But you got to look at them with a critical eye. you got to look for where's the sales pitch. you got to look for where is the person giving the information themselves be misled. How could they possibly have the experience that they're claiming to have, pretending to have, um, uh, you know, they just can't, right? And is there a salesperson involved? Yes, there's a salesperson. What information are they giving that, that is very salesy? There's quite a bit. So that is, that's that video, but um, go subscribe over there, watch some videos, and uh, definitely expand your view, but be aware um, of what you're doing. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, uh, please share on social media, tell friends about the show, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the relocation services because I kind of promised that I would uh, for those who wanted to stick around. And um, I just wanted to say, you know, I've had so many conversations this week where people are like, why aren't you selling relocation services? You should be selling relocation services because you, you've, this insight and this, this channel and all these people who are very interested in this, it, it has to be a thing that would make money. It's got to make sense and so forth. And I... I really want to put, point out just how much I appreciate this feedback. It really means a lot to me. The number of people who kept saying, but I understand that you don't want to be a salesperson, but um, you have a very trustworthy uh, demeanor and the stuff that you're saying, you know, it makes sense and you're thinking it through and you, you clearly care. Um, won't, you, won't you consider this as a business opportunity? And I think the thing that I need to say to everyone is, you know, the very thing that makes you feel that way, the thing that makes you think I'm being honest, the thing that makes you think I seem trustworthy, that makes you think I'd be good at, at uh, selling these services and, and offering this as a business, is the same thing that makes me not do it. If I was the person who would say, oh, you know what, I am going to become the salesperson and go out and, and sell uh, uh, relocation services and do that, um, as so many people have done, it would, it would make me feel, I would have to feel differently about myself and you would sense that and you'd say, oh, oh, it's like he's a different person now. And, and I mean, I, that's why I don't do it, right? Because I don't want to be that person and you don't want me to be that person. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's kind of like what made George Washington a pretty decent president. The fact that he didn't really want to be president, he didn't campaign to be president and then he retired, right? And you're like, well, but wouldn't it have been great if he'd have stayed longer? Well, Probably. He was a decent president, right? But had he stayed longer, he wouldn't have been the George Washington that we knew. I'm just comparing myself to George Washington. I realize I didn't mean to <laughs> make that comparison. That seems like an extreme one. But the point being is that he was in a position where he could have uh, done something much more than he did, and he voluntarily didn't. And the thing that it, the, the both things, the reason we wanted him to be president longer and the reason he wasn't president longer were both artifacts of the same thing. And, and that's I, on a ridiculously smaller scale. Here is what we're sensing uh, the same, I think, is that the things that make me not want to be that person, that I don't want to sell you properties, I don't want to be collecting hard money for uh, specific services, that I don't want to be in a position where I have to recommend Nicaragua or relocation in general because I'm financially motivated by it. As it is, I don't have a financial motivation to sell you on Nicaragua. I don't have a financial motivation to attract you to relocation. I could just as easily not change the topic of the show, but sticking to the same things that we have, I could switch to, here's why you shouldn't come to Nicaragua. Here's what I don't like about Nicaragua. Here's what I don't like about relocation. You shouldn't lo relocate. You should. I could have the exact opposite. It wouldn't change my audience because my audience is here because they want my opinions or they want uh, my rambling on things and I really appreciate you guys um, but you wouldn't be the same audience if I wasn't doing what I'm doing and I wouldn't be the same YouTuber if I wasn't doing what I was doing uh, and, and I fear that um, no matter how we slice or dice it if I make a business that I'm promoting um, that it is in any way tied to the content at least um, that that encourage me, encourages me to say certain things. And whether I would actually take my own bait or not, um, 
it would be difficult not to. And it would always make you say, well, yeah, I mean, I used to trust him. Now he sells this stuff, and now I have to think, is he just saying this because his, you know, like, like I say, just come to Nicaragua, try it out, right? If that was connected with, and if you'd like to pay me, like, I don't have to be like a hard sell. It could be like, look, if you want some stuff that I do, you can have my company help you with that. We'll arrange your flights, we'll, right? Well, instantly it's like, are, are you sure you're not just telling people to come to Nicaragua and try it out because, you know, 10% of those people are going to engage your services for that? I don't think that's why I'm doing it, but I, I might be incentivized to do that. And you would never completely be sure I wasn't incentivized to do that. So the only way I can be sure that we don't have that fake incentive or that, that inappropriate incentive, that conflict of interest, is to remove it. And so by not having it, it's the only way, uh, the, the only possible way for me to give you honest relocation advice is for me to be honestly an unpaid advisor, if, if that makes sense. Any amount of my compensation must be completely disconnected from the, the advice. And it's the same things I do in my professional life. I am a business consultant. Therefore, I cannot be a business or technology consultant if I was reselling something like the products that I'm talking about, right? Absolutely cannot be. The moment you're also selling a service, you can't be a consultant about that service. You're just a salesperson for that service, even if you're a good one, even if you're an altruistic one. It's it just doesn't it doesn't work that way, right? And so it, it's important. And so I really trust me. I appreciate so much everyone and the kind words and the motivation. And um, but I, I I think there's a couple things that need to be pointed out. One, I think that you guys are worried about the financial status of the show. Uh, yeah, it would be great if we brought in more money and this was uh, had more that we could throw at cameras and more that we could throw at equipment and more that we could throw at an editor and more that I could go out and travel and do stuff. All of that would be fantastic, I agree. And if we sold more things and brought in more money that we would be able to do that more. That is true. But the show is not on the, on the verge of collapse because there's not enough money to pay for it. Um, I don't need to make money from this show, so um, as much as I would love to make money from this show, that would be somehow magically fantastic. Um, uh, is that Frosted Lucky Charms? It's magically fantastic. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have to. I have a career. I have a job. And all that's fine. And, I, and I'm funded. All, right? all of this is paid for. If you want to buy me a coffee, fantastic. I'd, I'd Really appreciate it when people do that. You want to, you know, give me a super tip or whatever it is. Super thanks. I don't know what it's called through through YouTube. Fantastic. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, spread the word. Get other people to watch the show. Fantastic. That stuff adds up over time. Um, all those things are wonderful. Do that. Keep it neutral. There should be no tie between what I say and anything I ever sell. If if I have an advertiser and it's for phone services, great, because I'm not a phone service advisor. Uh, if I manage to get a sponsor for beer, great, because I'm not a beer advisor, right? <laughs> Those are not things that I'm giving advice on. I'm not warning someone that someone's trying to give you a bad price on beer or anything like that. So, um, and, and that stuff is, you know, the moment you have an advertiser, you have to be careful. Right, because um, let's just say I managed to get, we'll just say Corona, right? Let's pick someone who has no connection to the show that we will never get. Corona decides they want to sponsor the show, and I'm like, Corona, I'm going to drink a Corona. You know that Corona is probably not the beer I would have drank otherwise, right? So I don't want to be like, yep, here's my beer. Like, you know, how often do I drink Belkin? Not that often. Really like the hat, though. And, but I do drink it when I'm in Belize, so I drink it from time to time. Um, so, but I'm not being paid for this, right? So this is just a beer hat that I bought for a beer that I drank when I'm in Belize. And, um, but what if they sponsored me, right? How would that affect things? But you guys would be able to know, you'd be like, oh, okay, look, he probably drinks it sometimes. He probably actually does enjoy it, but he's drinking it more and he's wearing the clothes more because that's his sponsor. But you'd be like, that's okay. I'm not asking him which beer I should be drinking. I'm asking him where I should move or what he thinks about relocation or how residency works or what are good, right? So I really want those things to be disconnected so that you have confidence, absolute confidence in, in what I'm saying. Um, and, and it doesn't matter, right, if the show makes money or not. That's not why I do the show. Um, I, certainly, 
making money is better than losing money. So great if possible, but the integrity of the, the integrity of the show and what I do comes far ahead of of profitability uh, and the potential for profitability. And some people are really lucky. And, and Elton is one of the people I talk to, Elton from Immense Coffee. And he has this really great advantage that he owns a coffee farm. And it shows about his coffee and all that. And at no point does he have to like point out, by the way, I'm promoting my coffee. Like every moment of his show is like, obviously he's promoting his coffee, but you don't need to come to Nicaragua to drink his coffee. In fact, he doesn't sell his coffee currently in Nicaragua. So his show, talking about Nicaragua, showing Nicaragua, you know, discussing life in Nicaragua, maybe convincing you to come to Nicaragua to live yourself, to relocate, that's neutral compared to his coffee. He needs you to stay in the United States and buy his coffee to actually make money. Every time he says Nicaragua is beautiful, you should consider coming here, or I, I'm so happy I came here, you might think it's nice too, he's willing to give up his, and, and I understand on a single person basis, this is not huge, but he's willing to give up you buying his coffee in America so you can come to Nicaragua and, and experience it. So it's, um, it's easy to see how he's not financially motivated to give you bad advice. So that's super important. And it's great that he has kind of a built-in sponsorship of himself um, for his show. And, uh, and it gives him a really clear path that the show does promote his coffee, obviously does, I, he, I'm sure he has a, a noticeable number, I don't know if he knows how to track it, but he definitely has a noticeable number of coffee drinkers of his coffee in North America that found him because of the show, right? But he doesn't need to make a show about how great Nicaragua is. He doesn't have to have a specific opinion about Nicaragua. He could just be showing his farm. He could just be telling his story, but he's actually giving you all kinds of information about Nicaragua and Central America and the region and the weather in Acatal and all that stuff. That stuff is all incredibly neutral and he's not being um, motivated in one way or another. He could just as easily say Acatal is a terrible city and Nicaragua is awful and it's so hard to live here and what a struggle it is. Or he could be like, the weather's great and I love living here and, and things are, you know, sometimes there's a challenge but we love it. It doesn't matter which of those he says or something unrelated. It's still going to move the same amount of coffee. And so he's in a great position of being able to tell you honestly his opinions of Nicaragua and life here and all those things. And I want to make sure that we maintain that as well. I do want to point out that we, we do have some, you know, kind of weird, kind of semi-professional trolls who put in some serious effort. I cannot believe the hours and hours that some of these people put onto the show. But it's really, it's really encouraging, right? We're, we're, I remember when we got to the point where we had like our first trolls and like people were jumping on and being all negative. And they'd be like, find a keyword, hop on, say something negative and poof, right? And that was it. And it's like, okay, cool, okay, we, we've like attracted some automated stuff, we've hit some thresholds, that's like, that's like, okay, like we're getting somewhere. Now we have like people who are clearly constantly watching the show and, and just getting into every little thing and then tracking me down outside and, and trying to find old things and trying to figure out, but, but of course they don't understand a lot of the social media and the history and so they're getting things wrong and, and it's pretty funny. A long time ago, um, uh, so I, I've been online with a presence a lot like I have now. I mean, the, things have changed a lot, but I've been heavily online f since like 1997, 1998. And uh, mostly in my professional space, I don't mean like like on social, doing social media, just random, talking to people. Before social media as you know it today was in existence at all, I was online with IT communities and, and educational stuff and just a huge online presence. Um, and, and by 2000 was extremely online. Like, like I often refer to my show as the life online, um, that I'm, uh, the amount of my life that is on display, or whether in print or audio or video or whatever, is just uh, crazy. It's, it's truly nuts. And I'm, I'm currently in the process, we talked about this on the live stream, putting my old 20-year-old podcast back online in an easy-to-find form. It's been there, but it's been very hard to find. We're making, making it that you can subscribe again. And you can be like listening to it and be like, wait, wait, this is Scott 20 years ago. Like, that's kind of interesting. Not very, right? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. It's not very interesting. But especially to me, it's very interesting that I can go back and be like, wow, this is what I was thinking. This is what I was dealing with. This is what was important to me 20 years ago. Um, but be, 
maybe just because of who I am as a personality, uh, but, but definitely partially because I've been online and every single thing I've done for my entire adult life has been, this is recorded and it's going to be searchable for forever. A lot of people just kind of discover that one day. They go through school and everything is, you know, right to, to you know, uh, forget. And then one day you, you go online and you're public and it's like, oh no, people can record this. People can remember this. People can quote me. Um, but because I, I don't know, I always had that or just because I like being honest and I'm, I truly don't want to be scamming people, um, I have uh, dramatically in excess of a half million posts online, whether written or audio or whatever. And I stand by every one of those. I don't have skeletons in my closet. This is what is funny. These trolls are like, we're going to go find something. And they started posting stuff that I'm like really proud of. Like, oh, you got banned from this community. I'm like, yeah, I got banned from that community. And here's the post where I called them out for ethics violations. Here's the post where I, um, where they were going to kick me out and then couldn't years earlier because I had a federal warrant issued or there, I found a federal warrant issued and if they kicked me out of their community, they were looking at federal charges um, because they were involved in really large scale scams and I was calling them out on scams. I was constantly catching them in ethics violations um, and, and they would accuse me of things and I'd be like, prove it. Here's everything I've ever said. Where did I lie? And they'd be like, okay, well, we don't have where you lie. You meant to lie. I'm like, where do you get that I meant to lie? Like, I have a thousand posts on this one thing, all telling the truth. How does that lead to I meant to lie, but a thousand times accidentally told the truth? That doesn't make any sense, right? Clearly, you're lying, and over and over and over again. So I have this huge track record. And I, I understand that this sounds very weird and, and opaque. It's all online. It was a huge, huge thing in the um, information tech and, and business community back when there was a lot of social media around that online. I was super involved, by far the most published person in my field. And, uh, um, and because exactly what I do now, right, I call out um, marketing and propaganda. I call out salespeople. I call out things that are just false, right, or misleading or overpriced. And I would do that in the, these industries um, because that's what you do. Like that is what a true IT professional's job is. And so I'm teaching people how to do IT. I, like I ran university programs. Like I, I've taught classes. Like I teach my field. And part of that is if you're not calling out these vendors, you're not doing your job, right? Like that's our job at our companies is to go to our CEOs and be like, hey, this is a scam. Right? This is twice the price it should be. This doesn't do the job it should do. This is not well made. It is not secure. Uh, the, the vendor's lying to you. You can't trust them. Don't let them in the building. I started my career challenging a vendor. I'm not the one who actually did the challenge. My father did. But I started my career in information technology and software engineering because a vendor lied to management at a Fortune 20 company. And my father called them out on it. And I was brought in to prove the point. Um, and did and, and cost them their contract. Uh, and so from the very beginning, my, my entry into the working professional world was showing that there were people that were che trying to cheat the system by tricking people who didn't have the insight into the very specific things that they needed. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I didn't know this at the time, I was very young, but that, that's where I started, right? And so my entire career has been very heavily based on pulling back the wool and saying the emperor has no clothes. And so I have done a ton of stuff in the IT industry showing that common sales tactics are uh, illegal, showing that um, commonly held beliefs are just total myths, using math and logic and like being able to show these things whereas other people are like, it must be good because, and I'm like, here's the math that says, obviously you're, you're making that up, right? And here's, a, like, here's demonstrable statistics that back that up, like, and that, really has caused a lot of consternation in an industry where vendors make literally billions of dollars by hoodwinking everyone. Now, now we're in the relocation world. Um, things are a bit smaller, although we're kind of at a national scale in some cases. Uh, but, but, you know, we just, just got introduced to this um, obviously scammy, uh, I mean, it's not even scammy. It's a scam. This total con 
um, uh, relocation service in Paraguay. And I had my, my viewers with this con out of San Juan del Sur for mini houses that are prefabbed that obviously every single thing was fake. And including like all the bases, like so many more things were fake than even the people who realized it's fake realized. Um, and being able to call them out and being able to stand behind every time we call someone out, be like, no, I really truly believe, we have reasons to believe, we're putting in our time and research. Um, I want those things to be trustworthy. But one of the great things is, I have done this for so long in so many industries, and these, these trolls are like, we're going to go find this old stuff and dig it up. And I'm like, absolutely, dig everything up because you're going to dig for forever. It will take, and I mean this, a lifetime to go through my posts. There are whole enormous articles about my ability to produce content and how much I did. IBM did a study on it. Um, uh, they did a study on um, controlling privacy in the commons. And, and that was 20 years ago, maybe not quite, 18 years ago, right? 18 years ago, when I hadn't even really begun doing the stuff I'm doing now, I was in a position of talking to uh, leaders in industry about this space, right? Because I was so involved and did so many things. So if that's, you know, if that's something people want to do, the more they dig up, the more foundation it's going to create for, uh, we have a 25 year track record online in the public space. And like the one they were talking about, like, oh, you got banned from this community. Yeah, I already had an alternative community. We had already left because of ethics issues. We had moved on and formed a new community where ethics was held in high regard instead of being specifically something they didn't have. And we had been accusing them and proving on multiple occasions that they're involved in scams. So we knew they were an unethical organization. Um, they knew they were an unethical We had insiders who were like, here's how they're gonna try to cheat, here's what they're trying to do, um, here's you know what they're stealing. And, uh, and they knew, right? We had insider information that this is not an accident. They are aware of criminal activity and they're, they're trying to figure out how to stop you from exposing it, right? They're gonna delete your account, because right? And, uh, um, but one of the favors that I got and now it's Ziff Davis, right? They got bought out by Ziff Davis, so all stuff's protected this, to the best of my knowledge, because I'm not involved anymore. Ziff Davis has totally protected and, and turned it into a legit organization, but it was not in the past. And so they're pulling this stuff out and like, oh, look at this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> it's so funny, because all of that stuff exists, because the one favor I managed to get from them, even with all the, the stuff that went down, is I said, please do not delete any of this content because I want this exposed for all time, that I am leaving because of ethics violations, that I, every single post, is something I stand by. I'm not saying I never made a mistake, of course I did, but you can never, because it never happened, where I intentionally got something wrong. I never lied about anything, I never uh, misled anybody, I've had made mistakes for sure. Oh, I got the price wrong, I got the, the math wrong, I got the, yep, and if you can prove it, I corrected it, every time. Find an exception to that for sure. Start digging because the more you dig, the better. The I mean, I can't even begin uh, to defend um, as much as the public record. And that has always been one of my things. Every video I make on YouTube, it's here. You can go watch. You think I'm changing? I, people will be like, oh, you change your story over time. I'm like, what are you talking about? And it used to be in text. I'm like, find the quote. And they'll be like, well, five years ago, I'm like, let's go look at the same discussion five years ago. Here's the quote. Here's the quote from three years ago. Here's the quote this year. Always the same, right? Or they'll be like, well, these say different things. I'm like, yes, and look at the situation. The situation changed. I wasn't just blindly copying. I adjusted based on, you know, the math changed, right? Oh, Jimmy has 10 million to spend uh, and needs this. Bobby has 2 million to spend and needs this oh, you got different answers. Well, of course I got different answers because I was actually evaluating each of their situations, not just looking for a simple response that would be difficult to tell if I evaluated or not. By doing this, you were able to prove that I was putting in real effort to honestly evaluate each individual scenario. I'm not just posting um, to get attention. And it's like, oh. And it, it's, I've been dealing with the trolls for this for 25 years. Um, and, and, you know, I definitely know honesty, integrity, nothing, nothing makes a troll more frustrated than that. It's, it's a fun game. So when you're watching that stuff, 
I encourage people, if you have doubts, and I have videos on this, right? Trust and verify. I said this recently. I truly value uh, the integrity, but you're never going to have the faith in what I'm saying if you, from t at least time to time, aren't thinking critically, looking at it seriously, double-checking the sources, those kinds of things. Um, but there's never a time that I'm going to be like, nope, this is it. please don't look now, right? Always verify my stuff. And I can be wrong, right? And people have called me out. And, and we just had, you know, a lot of people came in and defended the VA. They said how, how bad the VA is. And, and a, quite a number of people who are, you know, not new, like that would be trolls in most cases. People who are actually members of the community have been interacting on things, came in and said, no, well, I've actually had really good experiences. And that's awesome that they have. Um, I, I do have firsthand uh, friends who have died because the VA specifically did a um, deny until they die on them. Um, most of those people are older, right, tend to be from Vietnam. Um, I'm really glad to hear that several people have been getting, I'm sure millions of people, right, have gotten good care from the VA. Um, definitely living here in Nicaragua, we have a tendency to meet a lot of vets who have not because uh, it's, it's a self-selecting situation, of course, right? If you go to the VA and get a bad experience and you have to find health care somewhere, well, you can't go in America in most cases. So people coming to Nicaragua where they're given the freedom to get health care that they need if you've had a problem with the VA, even if you're the minority. It doesn't matter if everyone has a problem with the VA or just 0.1% have a problem with the VA. The number that come to Nicaragua are going to be very likely from that self-selecting subset, if that makes sense. Uh, there, there's math there, right? Um, and so we firsthand experience people at a very high rate who have had VA problems because of the nature of where we are, what causes us to run into each other, right? So it can be not that the VA is on average that bad, although statistically there's a lot of problems with it, um, but it means that the numbers that do have problems are just statistically likely to be much more likely the ones that we engage with in another country. People who are having an amazing experience with the VA are just more likely to decide to stay in the United States. They want to stay with the VA because that's what they have. They want, they are just happy overall. They have serious conditions and they feel they can't leave, but they do feel like they're getting what they need. Those kinds of things, those encourage you to stay. Whereas if you have problems with the VA, it encourages you to leave. So the fact that one, that it's such, it's not like one's neutral. One's very much like you, you're likely to stay. One's very likely for you to leave. So it really self-selects pretty heavily, if that makes sense. Hopefully that does. Um, but that's a great example, right? Maybe the VA is doing a much better job than I'm imagining. Uh, it definitely is doing deny and die. There's, I don't think there's any question that that is something that the VA does. But a lot of people don't fall into that category and, and hopefully are getting very good care as much as possible. We hope that our veterans are getting excellent care whenever possible. All right, so that is my little rant for those who wanted to stay late. Thanks for hanging out and listening to that. And uh, I will see all of you tomorrow. And if you stay this long, you definitely need to click on one of the videos we're going to put up on the screen.